let's be clear on this point. It wasn't just that they asked for a pause. Uh, the president uh, specifically asked me and his gaggle of, uh, of crackpot lawyers asked me to literally reject votes. Joining us now is John Eastman's co-counsel, Harvey Silverglate. Harvey, I appreciate your time this morning. Do you expect your client to be charged? Um, well, first of all, he, he is obviously one of the unnamed, uh, unindicted co-conspirators. I was quite appalled that they didn't name him since uh, everybody knows who, who he, he was. Um, were they, was it a phony effort to protect his privacy or, or, or what? But yes, I'm 99.99% I'm, I'm .99 okay. sure that it's Eastman, my client. Okay. And you think he'll be charged? Uh, do I think he'll be charged? Uh, Charles Burnham and I, Charles is the, is the uh, main, main lawyer. He brought me onto the team because of certain um, targeted experience that I have in this arena. We are preparing a memorandum that we are going to send to the Attorney General of the United States sometime next week, uh, laying out the facts and the law and arguing that our client acted as an attorney advising a client that the advice was lawful and that Eastman should not be indicted. We are further going to say that if indicted, he is going to trial. If convicted, he will appeal. Mm -hmm. This is not a case where there's any plea bargaining in the future. Okay, that's interesting. So you're going to go to Merrick Garland and try to get your client not Ab charged by, by Jack Smith. Absolutely. Look, let, Trump's attorney... John Loro uh, is pointing at your client, Eastman. And here are several times in the last 24 hours when he said Trump did nothing wrong. This was what his lawyers told him to do. Let's play it. Trump did nothing wrong, and he acted according to the lawful advice of an attorney. Now, I want to make one thing clear. I am not a Trump I, fan. I just want um, you to listen, Harvey, if I could, Trump. to I what Trump's lawyer said. Here it is. Okay. Okay, I apologize. Go ahead. We don't have the sound. Go ahead, Harvey. I'm sorry we don't have the sound, but you can respond to what Trump's attorney, John Laura, okay. has said. Um, I, I expected Trump to rely on the advice of counsel, and the advice of counsel in, in this case was perfectly, perfectly legal. So you have no problem and you don't view this as throwing your client under the bus at all, despite these repeated pointings Correct. at your client. Correct. Okay. He, he, my, my client was the, was the attorney for Trump. Trump was enti is entitled to rely on the advice of the attorney. It was lawful advice. I have no problem with that. Let me ask you about a few of the specific things alleged in the indictment. Alleged in the indictment is that John Eastman, your client, asked the vice president's counsel, Mike Pence's counsel, to break the law in writing that he did this on the night of January 6th. The night of January 6th, after the insurrection, let me read from it, quote, co-conspirator to email the vice president's counsel advocating that the vice president violate the law and seek further delay of certification. Co-conspirator wrote, I implore you to consider one more relative minor violation of the ECA, the Electoral Count Act, and adjourn for 10 days. Would you concede that your client did that and asked the vice president to break the law? Yes. I, no, no, I don't concede that he asked the vice president to break the law. He asked the vice president to engage in a, a, a minority view, a very minority view, but uh, there's an interpretation of the law here that is within the bounds of reason. Uh, very few people would agree, but some people would agree. And, um, and you'll notice, by the way, there were no threats made. Uh, if there were threats made, that that would be a different story. He was Why? trying to persuade. It's in direct trying conflict. To persuade the vice president. It's in direct conflict with his own October 2020 document in which he wrote about the 12th Amendment, quote, nowhere does it suggest that the president of the Senate, that would be Mike Pence at the time, makes the determination on his own. So why was he telling the vice president to do it then? 
because he had a client. He was making the best argument he could in favor of his client. I have had many cases where I have made legal arguments different from my legal arguments in other cases. He was a lawyer for a client. It is his constitutional obligation to do the best he can for that client's interests. Uh and that's what he was doing. There was Har absolutely no crime involved. Harvey, two more People questions. People do not understand the role of lawyers. Yep. I understand the role Go of on. lawyers. I'm asking you about these allegations made in the indictment. In paragraph 18 of the indictment, it talks about what went on, the communication between your client and, the, uh, and what happened in Arizona, the Arizona House Speaker, a Republican who we know is Rusty Bowers. Did your client talk? to the Arizona House Speaker and ask him to decertify the election and then, quote, let the courts sort it out, despite saying that he, quote, did not know enough about the facts on the ground in the state of Arizona? We'll concede that, but what is, what is illegal about that? Nothing. What are you, what are you conceding? That's my, that's. Specifically, all, that all of that justice team has right? That is within the bounds of the law. That's what I'm saying. Did your client, let me ask you about another allegation then, on page, uh, paragraph 89, I should say, of the indictment. This is talking about knowingly violating the Electoral Count Act. Did your client, in fact, circulate a plan that he acknowledged would violate the Electoral Count Act, what we were speaking about before? Is that correct? That I'm not sure of. But okay. it, uh, assuming that he did, his role was as a lawyer trying to come up with the best arguments he could. I have had many cases where I've argued a point quite opposite something I argued in an earlier case. Lawyers have a particular role in our system. They do not have to be consistent from one case to another. But they cannot help in pursuance of committing a crime. The final question that I have for you is about the state of Georgia, because what's alleged here is that Eastman falsely claimed, we know without evidence, that Trump lost Georgia in part because 66,000 underage people and 2,500 convicted felons had voted that in the state that year. We know that not to be true. The indictment says that Eastman acknowledged in an email that he and Trump had, quote, been made aware that some of the allegations that I just read and evidence proffered by experts had been inaccurate, but the claims remained in the lawsuit. Can you explain why? Eastman was operating in his role as a lawyer and an advocate, and he had a constitutional right, in fact, an obligation, an ethical obligation, to make arguments that were in his client's favor. If ultimately it ended up in court and it was ruled erroneous, then he would obviously abide by that. But until there was a judicial edict, he makes the best argument he can. Again, he was a lawyer arguing as, as well as he could for his client. Harvey, 